Okay, in this video, I'd like to continue on my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number six, and I'm going to discuss the electric field of a spherical shell. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com, and if you'd like news or updates on my videos or what I'm doing, you can follow me on Twitter at adambt503. So there are a number of videos which are relevant to this before you, will say, attempt this particular question. So on my videos on electrostatics, we're going to be looking at videos 3A and B, which are the electric field of a wire with uh, symmetry and without symmetry. 4 then for a square and 5 for the electric field of a circular loop. However, this one is going to be much more difficult and a more practical and important example. So, you need, in other words, I'm saying that you need to be able to do this. But in order to do it, I recommend that you watch videos, uh, a video from my Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism series. Specifically, number four, where I discuss the law of cosines. I'll be using that in this video. From my tutorials on quantum statistics, you can, number, you can look at number 43, where I discuss spherical coordinates. So in this video, I will be using spherical coordinates. So for that reason, I obviously recommend you watch those videos. So, where do we go? What are we going to do? So, what we're doing is, we're going to have a spherical shell. Now, not, not, not a, solid sh a solid sphere, but a spherical shell. And I'm going to have a conductor. Let's say it's aluminium, for example. And we want, to we want to find out the electric field at some point outside it. So, we start off by defining our, we'll say, sphere in two dimensions, of course, it's a circle. So I'm going to have the z-axis coinciding with the center of the sphere. Okay, that's the z-axis. And I'm going to measure my electric field as normal at point P on the z-axis. My y-axis is out here. And my x-axis is this way. Alright, that's my, that's my x-axis there. Next, we need to, we'll say, we need to talk about a surface area or an infinitesimal volume, uh, vo or an infinitesimal area element. Because we're talking about the surface area, so we won't be doing a line integral, we, don't, we won't be using a volume integral, we'll be using a surface integral. So let's define a patch of, of the surface of this shell, the surface area to be here. Okay, and that's a certain distance, of course, it's on the center, or it's on the, the edge of the sphere, so it's a certain distance away from the, the origin, namely the radius of the sphere. Now I know this, I haven't drawn these very well, but I'm actually going to write it down here. But this, we'll say this, this length, line segment is of the length of the radius of the, of the shell, of course. Now, as normal, we need to then come up with our separation vector. So the separation vector is the this is, we'll say, the, the vector which goes from your source charges to your test. So this case, the test point is at P. And in this particular, we'll say, surface area element, it's, we'll say, this is my source charge, okay? So the, the vector points up that direction there. And this is my separation vector. Okay, this is my separation vector, like that. By the way, I've written all the formulas that we'll need here in a moment. So we note that this here is our infinitesimal area element, dA prime. Prime, of course, because we're dealing with sources. So notice that in spherical coordinates, dA prime is r squared sine theta d phi d theta. And the infinitesimal charge is sigma dA prime. Okay, so hopefully that's not new to you either. So where do we go from here? The next thing we need to do is define, uh, define some angles. But before I do that, I suppose it's probably best just to point out, even though it's pretty obvious, that the z distance will be as follows. Okay, that's the height above the center of your shell where you are uh, measuring your electric field. So I'm going to just define the following angle. As per normal spherical coordinates, I'm going to call this, this angle here the polar angle, and that's theta. If you extend down onto your xy plane in this particular case, your, your infinitesimal volume or area element and you join, uh, join it, we'll say, with the origin, you get the azimuthal angle, phi. So you have two angles so far. And finally, as you'll have seen in my previous uh, videos, we usually define our, the angle we work with up here. In this case, I'm going to call it alpha. All right? Now, there's one more thing which we need to do, one final thing we need to do. And we need to define the following, and you'll see why in a moment. So I'm going to bisect, we'll say I'm going to draw a line perpendicular to the z-axis, 
which is going to bisect or we'll say bisect these two lines here we'll say the separation vector and the radius so that's at 90 degrees there all right so let's just hold it there for a moment so by the law of cosines if you look at the law of cosines looking at the separation vector it can be written as it can be written as r minus z because if we have We'll say this were r minus z, or z minus r, excuse me. So say this would be z, and then we're going to have minus r. So for that reason, we can use the law of cosines, and that's going to be the, the, the answer. Look at my video on the law of cosines if you don't understand that. Next, in which direction will the, uh, the electric field be? Now there is circular symmetry because we are measuring. We are measuring. We'll say at um, you know at a point above the sphere. So let's take for example this. C this cylinder, I know it's not a sphere, but in many respects it's similar to, to a sphere. So let's say you are trying to measure the electric field at you, the position that you as a viewer are. Every point on the, the side of this particular tin, as you go around, will have circular symmetry. In other words, this is the xy plane, and they, it will not contribute. The only contribution will be in the vertical direction or the k hat direction. So that reason, you can think of, let's we'll say, discs going the whole way around, getting bigger, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, up to the radius, and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They will all be in the xy plane, and as a result, their horizontal components will cancel, and you'll only be left with vertical components because of the circular symmetry. So for that reason, the electric field is in the k hat unit vector direction. So we've discussed this. We've discussed this. I said that the infinitesimal area element is that, and I said the infinitesimal charge is that. I'm going to make the substitution that k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Note that it's different from k hat, which is the unit vector, but it's by convention that we use k. And finally, if you like, look at alpha, and you can find that alpha can be rewritten, or excuse me, the cos of alpha can be written as z minus r cos theta over the separation vector, or the magnitude of the separation vector. All right, so what we're going to try and do is calculate the electric field. Now I'm going to rub this out and I'm going to work from there. So I hope you can follow what I've done so far. So let's uh, let's go ahead and do that. So we need to calculate the electric field. So we're going to have the value of k, so 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 as normal. We're going to integrate. Now in this case, it's going to be sigma dA prime. That's going to be our infinitesimal uh, charge. Okay, so sigma dA prime. So we keep sigma, but we plug in what dA prime is. So that's going to be r squared sine theta d theta d phi, or d phi d theta, whichever way you want to do it. Okay, because we're trying to only get vertical components, we, we need to use the cosine of alpha, because that grabs the, the, the vertical components, something I've discussed and used in the past at this stage. So we're going to have the cosine is going to be z minus r cos theta. So this is the cos of alpha. And I'm going to speak about what's going to be at the bottom in a second. We're going to have, of course, uh, we're going to have, uh, yeah, we're going to have, we'll say, the law of cosines at the bottom, which is going to be the separation vector. But all of this is going to be underneath the separation vector squared. But because of this, cos alpha also has a separation vector. We're going to have three separation vectors. Okay? So you plug in the separation vector using the law of cosines, and you're going to have r squared plus z squared minus twice capital R times z times the cosine of theta. And all of this is to the power of 3 over 2. Now, it's pretty straightforward. If you want, you can do the integral for phi. Okay, so the integral of phi, it's going to go from 0 to 2 pi. So essentially, nothing else depends on phi, so you're going to integrate d phi from 0 to 2 pi. Of course, the answer is equal to 2 pi. So I'm just going to write that straight in and get rid of d phi. Okay, so we have another, a new, we'll say, factor of 2 pi. Now we have to do the cosine term, or uh, not the cosine term, the theta term, which is not as easy. So it's easier if we make the following substitution. We go that u is equal to cosine of theta. And as a result, we know, of course, du is going to be equal to del u del theta d theta. All right? So it's pretty straightforward. So if you plug that in, you're going to get that du 
is equal to minus sine theta d theta. All right? And if you look at the limits, just bear with me now, if you look at the limits when theta is equal to 0, we'll say u is equal to plus 1, and when theta is equal to pi, u is going to be equal to minus 1. So using those particular substitutions, we can rewrite our expression as follows. We're going to have e is equal to, by the way, I missed my unit vector k hat out here, because of course the whole thing is a vector. So we're going to have k, we're going to have 2 pi capital R squared sigma. We're going to have our integral between minus 1 and plus 1. And we're going to have z minus r times u divided by r squared plus z squared minus 2 capital R times z times the cosine of theta. And of course, all of that is to the 3 over 2. And we're integrating that d theta. Now, I'm not doing a course in mathematics, so you can just, if you're struggling, push this integral into Wolfram Alpha, for example, and it'll give you your answer. Or you can, but the, the technique we need to use in order to solve it is uh, you need to do partial fractions. But I'm just going to, I'm not going to do the partial fractions because that'll take me a couple of pages of writing, and I'm not going to do that. Maybe because I'm lazy, but I'm sure you can agree that we're only looking at the physics. So I can write down the answer as follows. We're going to have the, of course, we have k hat as well. So the electric field is going to be k, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, twice pi squared, or excuse me, twice pi capital R squared sigma. Okay, that hasn't changed. Then we're going to have a factor of z squared outside. And we're going to have the following insight. We're going to have um, z times u minus r. Oh, uh, z times u minus r divided by the square root of r squared plus z squared minus twice r z u. And we need to evaluate this between minus 1 and plus 1. All right. So the constants I'm just going to call beta for the moment. So there, that's going to be called beta. So we have it, of course, in the k-hat unit vector direction. So we can rewrite this by plugging in our limits as beta outside the following. z minus r over the magnitude of z minus r, and I'll explain that magnitude in a moment, plus z plus r divided by the magnitude of z plus r. Now note, by the way, let's say we pick a minus b. So we have a minus b, okay, and I want to square it. Well, that's, of course, going to be a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. Or you could say that the magnitude of a minus b is equal to the square root of a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So you'll find that in actual fact this here is the magnitude of z minus r. Okay, and when we plug in the limits, we're also going to have an r squared plus z squared plus 2rzu, which is the magnitude of z plus r. All right, so I can plug those in. And that's that. So there's our answer. This is the electric field, and it's in the k hat unit vector direction. So I'm just going to, we'll say, the important part of this isn't the answer, really. It's more what the answer says. And this is the, this is the important physics. So let's just write down the answer once more. We have that the electric field is equal to all the terms which are called beta, they're all constants. And we're going to have that outside of z minus r divided by the magnitude of it. We're going to have plus z plus r divided by its, all, its magnitude. Now the interesting point here is the physics, like I said. Note, by the way, these are both, like their mag the magnitude of both of these is 1. It's just going to be equal to 1. But the, the bottom term is always going to give you plus 1. But the sign of this is going to be dictated whether or not z is greater than r or r is greater than z. So, for example, this term is either going to be plus or minus 1. This is also going to be plus or minus 1. That's the only possible values which this can have, whether or not z is greater than r. So what we need to do is evaluate what this function or this field is at z greater than r and z less than r. So just remember... If 
there's Z, right? So if we're, ma if we're measuring the field at Z greater than R, we're outside. So we're outside of our sphere. And if we're measuring it at Z less than R, we're inside our sphere. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. I'm just going to write down the answers. You can do it yourself. It's like it's, 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 it's monkey stuff, of course. But you can write down the answer as follows. The electric field at Z greater than R is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over Z squared K hat. And look what that is. That is the electric field of a point charge centered at the origin. So the whole point of this is that the if you measure the the uh, the electric field of a spherical shell at any point outside the shell you get the same answer as if you had an, a, a single point charge at the origin. It is the exact same electric field. So you can ignore your spherical shell and just put a single point charge there. And notice the charge is if it's centered at the origin, it's not centered at the radius. It's centered at the origin. Very important. And finally, the electric field for Z less than R, or inside, is going to be zero. Because this is going to get minus one, this is going to give you plus one. Total answer zero. So inside here, E is equal to zero. This is a very important result. Okay, where it's, it's giving us a hint at something here. So, let's say, for example, this is my sphere, my Vaseline jelly. Okay, right. This is my sphere. It means that there is, if this is metal, okay, and it's a hollow shell, that there is no electric field inside it. The electric field cannot penetrate this shell. Okay, or there is no electric field inside the shell. The electric field begins outside the shell. And that's a very important result. It is, in actual fact, what leads us to, to make Faraday cages. So you'll find that you cannot have electric fields inside the conductors. All right, so that's all I've got to say about that. If there's one thing I'm going to tell you, you need to, you need to really understand the physics here and just burn that into your brain. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also visit universityphysicstorials.com.